Sky Level 2, Topic 2, Models. Uh, we are moving on to the second chapter, uh, Chapter 7, Credit Risk Models. And let's just do a quick summary of what we've seen thus far already in uh, Chapter Number 6. So Chapter Number 6, remember, uh, the title of that was Modeling Overview and Interest Rate Models. Now remember, guys, Let's just do a quick summary. Remember, if we if we go back to um, that particular section, okay, um, we looked at two major categories of models. We looked at the equilibria models, okay, and we looked at the arbitrage. Excuse the spelling, the arbitrage free models. Remember, we looked at those two models, two major categories of models. Under the equilibria model, remember, we looked at two. We looked at Vasi check, and we also looked at the Cox Ingersoll role mo Ross model, apologies, CRR model, and arbitrage free. We looked at the Holy model, and then we looked at a further model, which is a bit of an extension of Holy, which was the BDT model, okay, um, and which was obviously the model that, that was the more complicated model out of the four that we saw in terms of interest rate models, okay. Um, and that particular model um, looked at interest rate trees. Okay, we looked at up models and down models to try and predict what the the future interest rate was going to look like. Okay, and that's a little bit of a summary from topic uh, from chapter number six. And remember, very very important. If I could beg of you guys as we as we move forward through our particular uh, models, topic two, is that as we go forward, just to be very mindful of there are going to be a whole batch of models. Remember, just, hopefully I can whet your appetites just a little bit. Let's look what's coming. Uh, number seven are credit. That's what we're going to be covering now. Credit risk models. We then move forward to uh, chapter eight, which is going to be equity models, equity pricing models. Lovely stuff. And then nine and ten, I'm just going to put them together. Okay, those are asset allocation models. We're going to look at things like uh, uh, mean variance optimization and lovely things like that. Having said all of that, there is a ton of different models that we need to be mindful of, we need to go through, and very important if we can, as we see each model going through it, that we have a clarity of where the, what the model is, what it does, what its purpose is, what type of a model. Remember over here, if we look at the equilibrium models, you would, you would tell me correctly, those are first generation models, arbitrage free models are second generation models. And as we go through, you'll be able to tell me uh, at, at each and every point uh, a little bit about each of the models. Try your best to keep a clarity around the various models as we go, because they are many. Okay. As we jump over here, guys, into uh, chapter number seven, let's get going straight. Remember the learning objectives again. When we look at those, please, as you come out of each one, please be able to give a little bit of okay, uh, information about each one. Okay, As you go through them, you finish the chapter, go back then to right at the beginning and say, okay, well, let me just talk a little bit about each point over here and make sure that I've got a little bit to say about each point. By doing that, then you, you, you are more than comfortable in your knowledge that you have gone through the, uh, the chapter in enough detail. And you will be more than covered, of course, uh, for your exam. Okay, so there's the learning objects over there, guys. I'm not going to spend too much more time on that. You see those over there. Okay, just very briefly, just to whet our appetite. Hopefully it does. I hope it doesn't scare us. Okay, but we're going to be looking predominantly at this lovely model called the Merton model. We'll also be focusing on the KMV model, and the V should excite us a little bit because that's Vasicek. We've heard of him before. Okay, he was there under the interest rate model, and then we look at two different, also categories of models, guys. We are going to be focusing on reduced form models. What do those specific models talk about? Versus empirical credit models. What do those models talk about? So there's a lot of lovely stuff coming up, guys. But remember, just as much as we can, let's try and keep our heads about us um, as we go through this particular uh, chapter uh, due to the uh, extreme importance of it as we go. Let's go. Okay. Chapter 7, Credit Risk Models. We start off and we give you a, a basic intro into credit risk. Okay. We talk about the general credit instruments. Okay. We talk about exposure at defaults. Loss given default is all fantastic terms we need to go through, guys. Probability of default, recovery rate, 
two vitally important concepts, moral hazard and adverse selection, how they relate to credit risk, some very, very important stuff uh, coming forward uh, as we go through this particular uh, chapter. Okay, very important we talk about credit risk. Credit risk, quite simply, is the failing of one party to make payment um, on an amount that is that is due. Simple as that. Generally speaking, we refer to credit risk together, almost in one word, together with the first category, which is called default risk. Um, but we're going to give you a little bit, we're going to break down credit risk into four major categories. But generally speaking, people associate credit risk together with default risk and just refer to them generally as one type of, of risk. Okay, what is default risk? That is loss as a result of a counterparty not making, and, and it's either payment, guys, it could either be, okay, an interest payment or it could be a payment of principal. So it's either coupon or interest and failure to make any one of those two payments on the amount that is due will result in default risk. We talk about bankruptcy risk. Bankruptcy risk is when a company is no longer in business and the value of their assets when they liquidate is less than the amount that is being owed in terms of their liabilities. Downgrade risk is number C. What is downgrade risk? Downgrade risk is when one of the rating agencies downgrades the credit quality of a borrower. For example, they may downgrade them from a triple A down to a double A, okay, saying that their credit rating or their quality has been uh, reduced somewhat. Okay. It's not a default by any means, but remember, it may be a precursor to default when the rating agencies are getting a little bit nervous. It might well be that they are starting to think, well, oops, something, something is on the way. Okay. And the final risk is settlement risk. And settlement risk is a, is a little bit more general. Okay. Uh, the counterparty may not fulfill the obligation when any payment is due as a result of any kind of reasons. Could be a liquidity constraint, any other kind of operational issue. We talk about further issues over here on top of page four. Corporate events, mergers, acquisitions, thing, things like that may also impact a company's ability to make payments. Okay, um, something that's also important to remember. And top of page four as well, government actions. In other words, when a government takes some kind of action, capital controls, restrictions, anything like that may also uh, restrict payments. Okay, good. Some key, key definitions as we go through over here. These are vitally, vitally important, okay? We talk about the probability of default. Now, the probability of default is, is really just that. It's the probability of the borrower um, not making payment within the period that they are supposed to. And again, same story. It's either of interest or of principle. Okay, that is the probability of them defaulting. Remember, even in the event that they default, okay, the um, the holder of the investment may not lose everything, or that the recovery. For example, um, there may be some amounts that are able to be recovered on that loan via whatever 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 means. For example, maybe the sale of an asset. They may not recover everything, but there will be some recovery of what is uh, outstanding. Okay, we talk about the next uh, uh, definition, which is LGD. LGD stands for loss given default, in other words, and I like to read it with a comma. I say loss given that there's a default. In other words, how much do you lose once that there's a default in place already? We call this the loss rate. Okay, and remember, it's just the reciprocal of the recovery rate. So in other words, how much do you lose? Loss given default, LGD. Well, you lose one less what you recover. Okay. Now, uh, we had a, a, a Zoom session, and thank you to all those that were able to make it this past past week. Um, I, I'm aware some weren't able to. You know, we, we, we are trying to straddle the various time zones all the way from Singapore, Japan, all the way down to Peru and uh, North America, but we'll get it right, guys. Okay. And if memory serves, it was Lisa, I'm not picking on you, of course, just mentioning your praise, of course, uh, that was speaking about, uh, are there going to be a lot of ratios, equations, calculations that we need to learn in uh, CHI Level 2? Now, 
the, the answer is yes and no. Okay, yes, there are. I'm sorry to disappoint you, and you can see as we're going to go through this particular chapter, chapter seven, you're going to find that we've got a whole batch of ratios, equations that are going to come up. Okay, and why I say no a little bit, guys, is because if you look at this ratio, look over here. Is it a ratio that we need to learn? Yes, it is. No question. Okay, we talk about loss given default, but remember, guys, it's not something that I want you to pace up and down your lounges, dining rooms, wherever you're going to be studying, trying to drum that through your head. Loss given default equals one minus recovery rate. Loss given default equals one minus recovery rate. That's not what I want from you guys. Okay, I want I want the intuition behind the ratio. When you think about it, what is the loss given that there is now a default? It's one less what you recover. Okay, so very important as we go through this guide that we are able to intuitively look at some of the ratios to be able to, to, to work them out as opposed to learning them off the heart. So the answers are yes and a no. There are quite a couple of ratios, but we're going to have to start to learn through these ratios and through the models in, a, in an intuitive manner such that we are able to um, not have to spend uh, a whole batch of time learning them off the heart. Okay. We then move to EAD exposure at default. In other words, you may have taken out a loan for a certain amount, okay? Um, but as that um, as uh, the the default period hits, okay, there's only a certain amount of that loan might still be outstanding. That's called the exposure of the loan at default. Okay, the expected loss. Okay, now the expected loss is the key for us, and that's obviously the culmination of what we've done thus far. Expected loss is Again, everything we've seen thus far. So what is that? It's the exposure at default. In other words, how much is outstanding uh, at the default, the time of default, times what is the probability of me defaulting, times the loss, given that there's a default, or 1 minus the recovery rate. Now, here's your formula, lovely formula. Okay, and again, not something we're going to spend and lose any kind of sleep over learning off by heart because it's fairly uh, stock standard formula, able to work out with our intuition, of course, okay, intelligently. All right, something to, that, that I do want you guys to focus on over here, guys, and just to remember, okay, when we look at this, okay, the expected loss is exactly that. It's the loss that's expected. Now, if it's the expected loss, okay, what, what, what will a bank then do with the expected loss? The bank will price it into your interest rate. In other words, when you walk into the bank and ask them for a loan, okay, they, they ask you a whole ton of questions, and what are they essentially asking you? They're trying to work out, are you a good credit risk or not? What is your probability of defaulting? What is their expected loss on lending money to you? And you'll find out very quickly if the bank rates you highly or not highly. And how will you know? It'll all be in the interest rate. That's all you'll need to look at. You'll look at your interest rate that they give you, and you'll see if you're a, a good or a bad credit risk. OK, good. What is the other risk? Of course, guys, that's the expected loss. And not something that you need to know, of course, much more specifically for the FRM guys. They need to focus on this more. Okay, um, they, they need to be pricing in risk and things like that. So we look at the other risk, which is called unexpected loss. Now, unexpected loss okay, is losses that are unexpected or not expected. And of course, these particular losses, the unexpected losses, are not priced in because they don't they they got no detail on them. They are unexpected. But not something that you need to know, just something a little bit interesting as well. Okay. We look over here, the longer the time horizon, in other words, the longer the load goes on for, the greater the probability of default. Okay. For example, if I just say to this class, can anybody lend me a uh, $100? I'll pay it back tomorrow. I'm hoping that there's a fair measure of the guys that would lend me the money. Okay. Hope so. Um, depending on my credit rating, of course. And on the other hand, if I had to say to you guys, will, 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 will someone in the class please lend me $100? I'll pay it back in 10 years' time, okay? Uh, unlikely to get any takers, of course, because the longer the time horizon, the greater the probability of default. The exposure at default can increase over time. As the borrower draws down on his credit line, remember they got a nice credit line, the, the loan may increase, what, not necessarily, but it's one of the factors that we need to consider. 
Let's have a quick peek at an example over here, guys. Okay, and stock standard, nothing, nothing uh, uh, difficult over here. Just really, just let, we're going to just crunch a few numbers together over here. Okay, um, for our expected loss calculation. Okay, expected loss exposure at default. So uh, the loan started off at five million, but the outstanding at the time of default was only four million. That was my exposure. What's the probability of default? Two percent. What's my loss given default? It's a given. 45%. If they didn't give you loss given default and they gave you recovery rate, you would just go 1 minus the recovery rate, okay, and that would give you the loss given default. Okay, you run your numbers over there. My expected loss $36,000. And of course, as you can see, guys, it's not a massive amount as a percentage of the total amount outstanding. Okay, we move forward, guys. Two very, very important concepts that I want you guys to be familiar with. We talk about moral hazard as the first one. What is moral hazard? Moral hazard is what we, is a concept that typically we deal with it around insurance. That people tend to be a little bit more. I don't know if the right word is cavalier. Okay, or take more risks when they know that they're insured or not. For example, if your car is insured. Okay, people might leave it in a what would be regarded as perhaps a less safe place, whereas if the car is not insured, um, you find some cars are not insured, they, they, they lock the steering wheel, they lock the, the, the wheels, they, they do whatever they can, of course, to protect their vehicles, rightly so, because they are not insured. Okay, how would this, of course, relate to banks? Okay, the, 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 the connection between this and banks is that uh, moral hazard and banks is that there is a certain amount of uh, of your deposit that you put down with the bank that is insured by the federal government. I think it's called by the FIDIC, if memory serves. Okay, and they protect a certain amount of your of your money. Okay, and based on that, people will not necessarily look too closely to see if the bank is a safe bank or not to deposit their money with, because they know they are insured to a certain degree. Okay. We look at the next concept which is called adverse selection. And what is adverse selection? Adverse selection, okay, is much more of an insurance concept. And we talk about adverse selection, okay, uh, which is look at the words adverse and, and guys try and learn it from the words a little bit if you can. Adverse is obviously a negative selection. I made a bad selection. Talking about that from an insurance point of view, we say that the insurance company made a bad selection. What does that mean? It means that, for example, on a life insurance company, okay, they picked all the investment, all the individuals that were sick, unwell, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, was obviously not very good for business. Okay, on the other side, of course, okay, who are the people that are likely to be? Um, inquiring about or trying to seek insurance, those are the unwell people. They, they, they need the life insurance, of course, more than the healthy people, one would one would think. On that side, the insurance company have got to be a little bit mindful about who they give insurance to um, and how they pick the people that they give insurance to, to avoid this principle of adverse selection. Okay. And guys, that brings us to a close of learning objective uh, 7.1, an important one, but a basic introductory one. Okay, we move down to learning objective 7.2, a little bit about credit risk modeling. And remember, okay, now we talk about, we're going to be talking specifically about the various models. And again, let's get our head around the models just to make sure we know what section we're in. Are we in interest rates? We talk about their models. Now we're in credit risk. Let's talk about their specific models. And the first one that I'm going to be talking about is going to be structural models. Okay. And again, guys, when we come to the end of this, uh, we'll just have to pull it all together and make sure that we've got a good sense of exactly which models we are talking about and which ones uh, relate to each other. Okay. Model number one, and it's a major category of models, is called structural models. And it's in the words again, guys, structural Okay, what, what does it mean, structural models? It's in the structure, in other words, the this particular model of credit risk, in other words, to see how risky a particular business is, okay, relies very heavily on the company's balance sheet for its measurement of corporate credit risk. Okay, so the structure, relies on the structure of the company's balance sheet for its measurement of corporate credit risk. We view the value of the equity 
okay, as a, a long call option, okay, on the value of the company's assets. What is the strike price for the X is the value of the debt. Let's just talk about this very briefly. We talk about, uh, let's go back to basic principles at the beginning over here, guys, okay, is, and we know this, you know, this is nice and simple. Assets, okay, is equal to owner's equity, plus but it's just two sides of the balance sheet. Now, to the extent that the company's assets are greater, that's a good uh, investment. If not, obviously, there, there, there may be issues that are involved. But remember, it's a structural model, so we're looking at the company's structure or their balance sheet. Okay, good. Um, and we'll, we'll deal with this one in, in, in more detail as we go forward. Okay, okay. Company, we assume that the company is financed by equity and the issue of a zero coupon zero coupon bond okay and we'll go through this as we go forward okay and deal with this uh, in its own specific section but this is the structural model remember um, we're going to go through it in much greater detail as we go forward. we then move to the second category model guys which we call the reduced form models okay and in this particular section reduced form models okay is we rely on the fact that the company's uh, stock, okay, sorry, when using the structural model, my apologies, okay, our key assumption was um, that the company stock was traded on the market and we had a value for it, okay, however, in a lot of cases, that's not a fair assumption because we don't often, we don't always have a, a companies uh, being traded on a specific exchange and or, or on a market that we've got a fair value for it. Okay, and based on that came this thing called the reduced form models, and the reduced form models don't make that assumption that the structural models do, that we're working with a company's balance sheet, that the company's stock or equity is being traded on an exchange or on a market that we have a value for it. Okay. And they work with what comes out the structural models, okay, the output of the structural models, and, and guys, please don't be worried yet. Please just get a bit of a sense of what we're dealing with now. Okay, we're going to go through these all in great detail. That's the rest of the chapter, by the way, is the various models, the detail behind those models. Okay, came along the reduced form models, as we said. They work with the output of the structural model, and however, they incorporate real-world assumptions which may not necessarily be in the structural models because not every single company has got a fair market value or traded market value. We move through to the third one which is empirical models okay and I don't know if you, how many uh, of us are familiar with some of these models for example the Altman model um, Altman's had his own score for the modeling and what they do is they come up with a specific credit score and then they could say okay okay um, is, 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 is the company a, a credit risk or not uh, it will the company survive or not based on the particular credit score that was arrived at when they calculate um, so that they, they run models and we'll go through some of those models of, of course you don't need to know all the, the, the great detail behind um, those models and how to calculate each and every little bit of them because that would, you know some of them are, are long and detailed okay but we'll have a look at those and make sure we've got a bit of a sense of those so that we, we are able to uh, just be able to conclude on the empirical models okay so guys as we come out of this particular section okay we look at we've got three different types of models we have got structural models that work with the balance sheet of a company okay we've got these things called the reduced form models that don't make those assumptions okay they work more with real world assumptions and they work with the output that comes from model number one structural models and then the empirical models that work with specifically uh, ratings and credit scores will work with those uh, things like the Altman model we'll look at those as we go as we go okay what we do now is we go into some of the um, the more detailed models so we've dealt with remember guys and it's very important that we are able to break these down nicely for ourselves that when we have a look at these guys that the model is when you look at these different models we have three three different types generic types of models under credit so if, again I just want to make sure that we've got a complete clarity behind these we've got credits 
models or, or credit risk models is probably a better term. And when I look at credit risk models, I've got three specific credit risk models. Okay, we have got the structural model. Okay, we have got the reduced form model. And then we've got what we call the empirical models as well. What we're going to do now, and I'll just give you by way of example, is like, for example, the empirical model, we, we, we start to give you more details surrounding those models. For example, uh, we'll talk about Altman's uh, model, which is called the Z-score model. Okay, And we'll do the same thing, of course, for the structural model as well as the reduced form uh, model. Okay, good. And away we go. Let's go. Okay. You can see straight away what I'm dealing with over here. I've got assets equals owner's equity plus liability. So we're dealing much more in the structural uh, aspect of things. Okay, good. Very important to remember, okay, the value of a company's assets, assets is equal to owner's equity plus liability. Okay, one of the assumptions of the Merton model Okay, that we work with over here, guys. One of the key assumptions is that the company was financed. In other words, what is the liability that we're referring to? Okay, uh, issue of a zero coupon bond. Okay, so that is the liability. It's a zero coupon bond. In other words, a bond, a liability that does not pay, there's no interest attached to that. Okay, now, when this liability becomes due and payable, this is all part of the, this particular model. When this liability becomes due and payable, there's only two possible scenarios. The assets are worth more than the debt, okay, which is obviously what, what, what one hopes for. Okay? The assets are worth more than the debt. That's a positive position. Or number two, a negative position. The assets are worth less than the debt. Okay. Under scenario one, Okay, the assets are worth more than the debt. The debt will be repaid okay, with the excess assets, and the balance is then available to the equity holders, okay, um, etc. What's really happening over here, guys? This is important just to see that we can understand the picture. Okay, what's happening, okay, because the assets are greater than the liabilities, okay, what we say over here, okay, is that the Equity holders now jump into the pot, okay, and they exercise the option to buy these assets, okay, and what do they do when they buy the assets? So the equity guys come on board and say, oh, look, assets are worth more than the liabilities. Yes, we want to buy all of the assets, okay. What will we do once we bought them? Well, we'll pay off the liabilities and we will keep the change, okay. Now, the question is, why would they do this, and what price can they buy the assets at? We call that the exercise price. What is the exercise price? Okay, that, we, we spoke about that a little bit earlier. Okay, that is the, um, I'm just going to take you back a page to show it to you exactly, so we, so we are, it all, hopefully all starts to tie in. Okay, um, the call option, or the amount that, they, that the equity guys can buy that is, the value of the debt. So, of course, that's why they would buy it, wouldn't they? If I take you forward a page, guys, that's why the equity guys are so excited to buy the assets because they can buy it at what price? The exercise price, which is the value of the debt. And we know that the assets are worth more than the liabilities. So, yes, they will exercise their, their options. What do we call this, guys? This the, scenario one, when the assets are worth more than the debt, what is that called, guys? Okay, it's as if the, the, the equity is equal to a long call option. In other words, there's a call option, the option to buy the company's assets. Okay, at what price? The X is equal to the value of the debt. What is this? How would we express this, guys? The value of equity is equal to a maximum of either zero because they may just decide to walk away like they can with any kind of option or assets less liability. We always call the liability, we denote the liabilities with a K, the face value um, of that debt. Okay, so as we come out of this particular, this first section, the first assets are worth more than the debt, 
we come out of this and we say to ourselves, okay, um, how does it work? How is it expressed? First of all, let's go step step one by one. Step number one, the liabilities. In other words, how was this business financed? K okay, is equal to K is equal to a zero coupon bond. That's how it was financed. Now, what's equity equal to? The equity guys have done what? They have gone long or bought a a call option, in other words, the option to buy, to buy what? Long a call option, a call option means, it's the, I'll write it in English, not in, not in finance, it's the option to buy, and what have they got an option to buy, to buy the, the company's assets. What is the exercise price? What's the price that they, they are allowed to buy the company's assets at? X, which is equal to K, or the zero coupon bond. When will they decide to buy the company's assets Okay, at the zero coupon bond amount, or the K? When will they do that, guys? They will do that when the assets are worth more than the liabilities or the K. What will they then pocket? They'll pocket the change, which is, of course, the equity portion. And equity is then equal to assets, less liabilities. Does that make sense, guys? Okay. And, of course, if I take you back, I have skipped something out. Okay. We'll just change colors to make it a bit clearer. Under scenario two, but the assets are worth less than the debt, what will the equity holders do? Well, remember, the equity holders have got the right... They bought a call option, they've got the right to buy the company's assets at what price the debt, but the problem is that the assets are worth less than the liability, so what are they going to do? They're going to, they'll walk away, and they will not exercise their option, and there we go. We'll talk about that more as we go. Okay, over the page, oh, let's have a quick look at example, top of page 7, okay. Assume that the value of a firm was $100, the value of the debt was 80 What is the value of my equity then, guys? My equity is worth, it's a maximum of zero, or assets of 100 less K, which is the liability of 80 So no prices over here. What would you decide to take? Zero or 20 million? Well, I think I'll take the 20 million. Thank you very much. Remember, guys, this is a little bit back to options terminology and we talk about it in terms of a max function of course. Okay. Good. Okay. We now talk let's talk a little bit in the Merton model more specifically, guys. What does Merton say more specifically? Okay. The Merton model says that the firm's risky debt is equal to owning what? Okay. Risk free debt Okay, plus, now look at the words, writing or selling a put option on the assets. Okay, good. So, what's the debt equal to? And this is the, under the Merton model. Remember, the Merton model is one of our first models that we work with. Okay, so the debt, look over here, debt, according to uh, Merton, what is debt worth? It's equal to K, which is the... Um, the um, the risk-free debt or the debt, not, not the risk-free debt. My apologies. The face value of the debt less okay a maximum of zero or k minus eighty. And remember, eighty is the assets again. Okay, so that makes sense. Over. Let's look at an example to make that a little bit clearer. Remember, guys. Now we have stepped into the Merton model. Merton model says debt is equal to K minus. Okay, let's have a look at that. Assume that the value of the firm was 70 million and the face value of the debt was 80 million. In other words, not an overly healthy position because the debt is greater than the value of the assets. Okay, what is the debt worth? Well, the debt's 80 million, isn't it? But that's not what it's worth. That's what it's sitting at. That's its face value. Merton's going to come along and say, tell you what it's worth. And he says to you, well, it's worth K. K is its face value. Happy. Minus a maximum of zero or K minus 80. 
and that is the face value of the debt less the asset, which is 10 million. So, of course, we take the max function, we take the 10 million, 80 million, which is the face value of the debt less 10 million, and in fact, as Merton su uh, suggests, the value of the debt is really only 70 million, which is correct because the firm is only worth 70, you'll never recover your full 80 million over there. Okay, good. And that is how, so now if we have a look at, let's, let's go a little bit further. Remember what we always say, assets, the, the, the good old basic accounting equation. Assets equals owner's equity uh, plus liabilities. Okay, now let's try and express this a little bit. So 80 or the assets of the firm is equal to the equity of the firm plus DT. And remember now, we know what DT is, don't we? Okay, in the Merton model, if I just if I rate, just clean up over here to make sure we've got a little bit, of, we can see it nice and clear. Okay, what is DT in the Merton model? Well, there it is. There is your definition of DT according to our model over there. It's a little bit longer than just the expression DT, but there we go. But is everybody comfortable that what I've got over here is nothing fancy? It's the good old uh, uh, balance sheet model. I've got assets, I've got equity, and I've got debt. Merton gave us a nice definition there of the debt. Okay, good. We can move this around a bit, of course, guys, and we can say debt is equal to, if I want to do, remember, if it's assets equals equity uh, plus liabilities or debt, if I wanted to put liabilities, isolate that on its own, I would take equities that side. Just in, this is just really a little bit of financial engineering, moving things around in terms of the equation. And liabilities then is equal to assets minus equity over there. Just follow through. Very important, guys, as I go through this, guys, that you are that you are familiar with each and every step as we go. This is not easy stuff. The Merton model and the Black Skulls option model is not an easy model to get. Okay, so we work through it quite slowly, and let's get each and every step. Now, if you wanted to expand on this model a little bit, what could you say? Okay, we could say that what? DT, debt, which is that, is equal to 80, the assets, which we know. There's no fancy definition for assets or anything really to expand much on assets. It's because the assets are the assets, okay? Less a max of 080 minus K. Now, where on earth does this come from? All of a sudden, we're throwing something in. Max, and obviously, we, we, we're defining equity as that. Where does that come from? Now, you know where that comes from. If I take you back two pages, let's go. Okay. Remember, what is the value of equity? The value of equity, okay, let's just clean up here. I know it's a little bit messy. The value of equity is equal to ET or equity is equal to this right from the beginning, guys. Remember, we, we, we defined equity as a call option on the asset, which is equal to max of zero or assets... Yes, the debt. There we go. Maximum of zero or assets less the debt. There we go. So all I'm doing, guys, and what I've done for the last two pages is really gone through each and each, each definition. And as we come out of this particular section, what we're seeing is that that, that we can break down each of the various uh, um, uh, portions. Okay, in our equation, but remember, guys, keep it as simple as you can, and always go back to the accounting equation. Assets is equal to owner's equity plus liability. Remember, we've got a much more detailed definition of owner's equity, which, in fact, is that. We've got a much de more detailed definition of liabilities, or what we're going to call DT, Okay, given to us by Merton, which is based on the previous page. Remember, if we go back over here, there's your more detailed definition of that. Okay. Good. Okay. And away we go. Okay. And just the conclusion, guys, very important before we get to the real hairy stuff. Okay, just to clean up over there. What do we see over here? We see that based on this last equation, what is the value of debt? Okay. It's equal to the value of the assets, okay, less a call option. Because remember this, this max function, right in the beginning of what we saw over here, is really just a, what we called a long, the equity is really just a long call option, okay, and what's the exercise price? The exercise price is equal to 
the let's call it the K or the liabilities. Okay. And that's essentially what the value of the debt is equal to. Okay. Assets. Okay. Um, less those liabilities. That's it. Okay. So assets less the equity, my apologies. Okay. Now we're just going to pull this all together, guys. Okay. Remember, Merton model falls nicely within the, 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 the structural section that we deal with over here, guys. Okay. Remember, of course, Merton is a structural model. No need to tell us that, but it does anyway. Merton is a structural model, of course, because it uses the structure of the company's balance sheet. Okay. When we now put the Black Skulls Merton model in, when we use a few changes, of course, we can value the equity for any period that we like. Okay. Some changes that we'll need to make when we're looking at this over here, guys. Okay. If I wanted to value the equity at other periods, I will need to use a constant rate, which is called R. We assume continuous trading, as we always do with the Black Skulls Merton model. Continuous versus, of course, discrete. We use a log normal distribution and volatility is assumed to be constant. Volatility, of course, as we know, is always expressed by the standard deviation. Okay, good. Now, okay, when I wanted to, now if I, if I really wanted to get a little bit uh, more fancy, okay, and say to you, by the way, what is the value of equity? Well, before I look over here, guys, we know assets equals to equity plus liability. If I want you to get equity on its own, it will be equity is equal to what, guys? Assets minus liabilities. That's all. Nothing fancy. If I now want you to express this equity okay, in terms of the Black Skulls Merton model, how would I do it? Okay, we look over here, guys, and trying to just express this in a slightly different way. Okay, and what do we see? Okay, here is my asset section. Okay, over there. That's assets. F sorry, first of all, okay, we'll change our color over there. That's equity. Equity is equal to assets in the blue over here, and the blue is obviously assets as expressed in terms of how I value it using the Black Skulls Merton model. That's the Black Skulls Merton formula for it. Okay, minus liabilities. What's what, what? And how do I value liabilities using the Black Skulls Merton model? Well, I, it's a little bit more, uh, a little bit crazy over there. But hey, that's how I look at the value of equity. But remember, coming back to stock standard things again. Really, what is this guy's? It's just assets is equal to. Sorry, my apologies. Okay, uh, not assets. Um, equity is equal to assets minus liabilities. That's it. <laughs> yes, it's all done in fancy black skulls terminologies, etc. But you don't need to know all the detail black skulls. I'm not going to ask you that, guys. Sure, in terms of formulas, that's not coming up. Yes, I have put it for you in your formula sheet, of course, guys. Um, but no, that's not what's expected of us to know. Because, And how do I know that that's not what's expected of us? To learn these detailed calculations, let me just show you something that will hopefully help you as you go through your Kaya uh, studies. Uh, where am I? Okay, there we go. Okay, so take you back a page, back a page, look over here. Okay. And all it tells me over here is just to use the models, not to calculate with the models. If I look through over here, guys, at some of my, uh, it says demonstrate knowledge of the Merton model. Okay. And we'll go through some questions, well, but it doesn't necessarily say use the formula and do a calculation of what the values are. It says use their models. And I'll show you how we do that as we go forward. But again, don't spend too much time on the on, on the great detail behind it because it'll just give you um, a little bit of a headache and it's obviously not where we need uh, to. We go forward over here, guys. Um, let's just make sure we are where we need to be. There we go. Okay. And that's the end of that. That, that is the Merton Black Skulls model. If we look at some, some more information surrounding the model over here, guys, okay. Um, D is what's going to give everybody a little bit of a headache when I'm trying to do the calculation, which is that D. What is D? Well, D is equal to 
that's straight out of the Black Skulls Merton model. Because I'm not going to spend too much more time over there. As you can see, guys, why is there a lin or logarithms being used? Because I'm dealing with what, guys? Markets are continuously traded. Remember, as part of the Black Skulls Merton model, that was one of the key assumptions that we made. Okay, we move forward a little bit over here. Okay. If I wanted to calculate a put option, and again, guys, I put this in for you, but no, this is not obviously where we need us to be, of course. I put it in for you, but there it is. What is the price of a put option? Okay. No, we're not going to spend too much time on that. Remember, guys, this is not a lecture on Black Scholes Merton model particularly. It's not a derivatives class. We saw that uh, predominantly, guys, remember, in Chi Level 1. It's just really to get an understanding more of the structural model and how things work together uh, based on that. Okay. And having said that, guys, okay, we know a little bit about the model. Okay. The model works with the Z tables. It works with probabilities and all good things like that. Um, but no, I'm not going to be spending too much time on another, and I don't want that to be uh, your key focus. Okay, I want you to understand what is a structural model. I want you to understand how the model is built up. Equities, assets, liabilities. What equities equal to? What assets are equal to? What liabilities are equal to? Etc. Okay, we move to the top of page nine over here, and again, uh, you're going to breathe a sigh of relief. Um, when, when I show you this, um, uh, and that is not a required thing that I want you to learn, of course. I'm going to show you another way of doing that as we go further through the notes. It will still come. Okay. What We talk about credit spreads. And what is a credit spread? Okay. A credit spread is exactly that. It's a spread of credit. So it's the difference between the yield on a risk-free bond and the yield on a risky bond. So what would a what would a risk-free bond be? A risk-free bond would be a bond, for example, a government bond, a US Treasury, and the yield on a risky bond, a, a risky bond we would probably define as being a corporate, a corporate bond. Now, and why is there a difference? Let's say, for example, the risk-free bond trades at 1% yield and the, the corporate bond trades at 5%, we would say that my credit spread then is equal to? 4%, which is the difference in yields. Why is there a compensation? Well, that's additional risk of taking on uh, for the risky bond. The zero coupon bond can be valued as follows. Very fancy, guys, but nothing too, too much over there. We have seen this before. What is this fancy formula telling me, guys? Okay, It says to me, well, K is equal to the face value of the particular bond. Okay to the exponent, which is over there, I've left the times out because you can just put it to the exponent, okay, and what I do, okay, E minus the rate, okay, what is the, and what is the rate, the rate is the risk-free uh, portion plus the spread, that's the total rate, times by the time period. And that will give you the value of a bond. We're not going to, not, obviously, this is not the place and all the time to, to work it out. But as you can see, guys, when I've got an, remember this, remember this from Kylie Level 1 very well. When I've got an E or an exponent over there to a minus, what is the calculation always going to really be? What kind of a calc is this? It's just a present value calc. Remember that. So because it's a minus to the E, it's really just a present value calc. If it was a plus to the E, what would that be? That would equal to a, a future value calc. Just a little bit of revision for what we saw in Chi Level 1. Wow, look at the credit spread here. You thought we had some fun before. The fun is just getting more and more. Okay, that is your calculation for the credit spread. Are you going to learn that? No, you're not. I've given you the detail there. I don't want you spending time. Okay, and there's a little bit of example. Guys, if you want to go through the, the, through the example, just you, you might, might decide to do so. Okay, uh, there we go. You, you can have a look at that, guys, but this is not, obviously, this is not the area, and unli very unlikely this is going to be the detailed calc that they're going to be asking you in your exam. And the truth be told, if this is something that they're going to insist that you learn off by heart for your exam, it may well be worthwhile to forsake or forego the one mark for the purposes of just keeping your head a little bit sane, but highly unlikely that this is the calculation. 
um, coming out of Chi level 2, guys, remember, this is stuff that they had in Chi level 2 before as well. This is not new stuff. It was in another section before, okay? It wasn't uh, over here in models uh, before. It was under hedge funds, credit strategies in Chi level 2, but they never asked this calculation in any of the exams whatsoever. So obviously, I'm not going to be focusing too much on that. Okay. The term credit spreads is very important, which is the spread between a risk-free and a risky uh, 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 a debt instrument. But these detailed calculations are not where I obviously want our focus to be. I've shown you the calculations over here. You calculate all your things. You calculate D, which is your probability. Okay, And once you've got your probabilities, you would then go and work. They would give you... The, the standard normal distribution or what we call the Z table. You go look at the Z table, you read your numbers of the Z table. Okay. Um, obviously, when you go look at the Z table, you would go and look at 2.084. You would get an answer or a probability of 98.12%. Under 1.815, you get a probability of 96.49%. Guys, this is not the area that I want you to be focused on at all. Okay. Then you go and value your equity. And then you can get the value of debt. And remember, what is the value of debt back to back to basics? The value of debt is equal to the value of assets less the value of um, the equity. I've just gone ahead over here in this long calc, which I don't want you focusing on, guys, and value the equity at 204 or over there. Assets are 500. Where do I get the assets of 500? Over there. And I go back to my stock standard calculations that... Assets equals owner's equity plus liability, and I can move that equation around as I need to do. Okay. And the final little part over here, I'm sure you guys are all relieved. The rest of the, the rest of this chapter does get a little bit easier, of course, is we have a quick look at advantages, disadvantages, and the properties of the Merton model. Okay. Um, have a quick look at this, guys. Some of the assumptions, we work with the risk-free rates, okay? Leverage, the greater the level of leverage, the greater the probability of default and credit spreads. Remember, the more leverage there is, the greater the chance of a credit event, okay? Asset volatility, the greater the level of asset volatility, the greater the probability of default. Then we look at this concept of maturity, and we said this before, the longer the term, the greater the probability of default. Just have a good a bit of a sense of those four factors over there. Advantages of the Merton model. It uses option theory, which is obviously a very accepted uh, theory. Current market prices are used. And of course, current market prices are used, guys. Why do we say that? Because we are in which model? We are in the structural model. And once we are in the structural model, we are obviously using current market prices as opposed to when we get to the next model, which doesn't make the assumption of current market prices, which we call the reduced form model. And the last little bit on this particular section, guys, we look at the disadvantages of the Merton model. Okay, It keeps the inputs constant even when the cycle has changed. For example, we know very well part of the Merton model is that the volatility assumption remains constant. The model is not realistic. Okay, it's an assumption of a simple balance sheet structure with only one specific class of debt, which we call we call the debt, we call the debt K, which may not be correct. The model relies on the fact that company assets are traded, and remember we, that's that's part of the structural model, may not necessarily be correct. For that we go back to the reduced form model. And the last one is the inputs are not observable, and because they're not observable, historical estimation cannot be used. Guys, as we come to the end of learning objective 7.3, it is a fairly complicated one. Uh, uh, go through it slowly, but take the key uh, parts of it out and work with the, 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 the more important stuff. Don't focus on the, the, the great detail behind, for example, the Black Skulls Merton model and all of their detailed calculations. Work on the big stuff and understand the theory behind it.